Hello, everyone. I would like to welcome you to another episode of Around the Fire. And this episode, uh, episode we have P.D. Mangan. He is a rogue health expert, a microbiologist who at age 65 has shown that you can change the trajectory of your life at any age possible. His Twitter feed is far more informative than USDA or any government funded quote unquote health gu guidelines. He's the author of several books, including Muscle Up, the topic of this interview. Welcome to the show, P.D. Mangan. Uh, thanks, Mo. It's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, sure. So uh, the main thesis of this book, as I have uh, seen so far, and as I can understand from your tweets, is that uh, you find resistance training superior to any other kind of exercise, including aerobic uh, exercise. And even more than that, you find aerobic exercise detrimental. Uh, could you expand on this concept a little? Uh, sure. Um, well, for, first of all, uh, as far as um, aerobic exercise being detrimental, that, that might be going too far with, with what I want to say. It's difficult to um, effectively criticize forms of exercise because really in most cases, any exercise is doing any exercise is better than doing nothing. Um, so, you know, if, if somebody wants to go jogging, for example, or something like that, they can improve their health for sure. But there are, are, are better ways, safer ways, uh, ways that are more effective um, so, um, as far as resistance training goes, um, obviously what it does is improve your strength, improve your muscle mass, increase your muscle mass. And that is very important. Um, and there are several reasons for that. One is that muscle is a metabolic sink. Um, most of your metabolic activity goes towards your skeletal muscles and by improving their fitness by improving their strength. You uh, can increase the size of that metabolic sink. You can uh, improve your metabolism overall. So for overall health. Uh, another reason is that uh, as, as we age, we lose muscle. This is pretty universal. So um, this can be detected as early as, you know, by, by the time someone is 30, they have detectable muscle loss. Um, and as each decade goes by, this muscle loss actually accelerates so that by the time somebody is quite old, say about the age of 80, they can have lost half the muscle mass that they had when they were younger. And that is really a disaster uh, in terms of health um, it, it leads to, for one thing, um, worse metabolic health, diabetes in extreme cases. Um, and, and so from that point of view, it, it's definitely bad losing muscle. Another reason is that as people get old, um, they become frail. So in, in, again, in extreme cases, when someone's very old, it, it really not even necessarily in extreme cases, uh, this, this happens to people who aren't even that old, um, they can be so weak that they cannot do their normal activities of daily life. Um, again, in an extreme case, maybe not even get out of the chair they're sitting in. Um, uh, you know, and when that happens, People need assistance just to live their daily lives. They need somebody to help them. That's the sort of situation that can often end in a nursing home, uh, you know, because they, they just have to be taken care of all the time. In terms of um, resistance exercise, strength training versus aerobic exercise, um, aerobic exercise can actually lead to loss of muscle mass. So you can see that pretty apparently in people who do extreme levels of aerobic exercise like marathon running. Um, 
and and so it's it's just more it's just more important to uh, build muscle. And another thing, uh, which is which is important, is that there, in most people's minds, there exists this uh, dichotomy between resistance training and aerobic exercise. So um, this all started way back uh, several decades ago in the 1960s, uh, Dr. Kenneth Cooper was, uh, was and is a doctor. He's, he's still around. He's, I think, in his 90s now. But um, he um, formulated the idea of aerobic exercise, um, and, and his book was called Aerobics. Um, and he uh, tested a lot of people and came up with various formulas that people could use to um, to improve their cardiovascular fitness. Um, the basis of aerobics is basically um, exercise performed at a moderate pace for a longer length of time. And it came to be seen, aerobics came to be seen as a unique form of exercise that people had to do to improve their cardiovascular fitness. Whereas more recent research over the last decade or so has shown that high intensity exercise can improve cardiovascular fitness in a uh, more just as effectively, if not more so, and in a much shorter time frame than uh, aerobics, than 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 moderate intensity exercise performed over a longer duration. So when we're talking about high high intensity exercise, we're talking about uh, very intense activity performed for as little as thirty seconds at a time. So um, resistance training, if done at a high intensity, can uh, fall under this category of high intensity exercise. And certainly resistance uh, training, as I practice it and I advocate it, um, if, if done properly, does absolutely improve cardiovascular fitness. Um, so this dichotomy between uh, aerobic exercise and resistance training is largely a false dichotomy. Um, people can get very fit doing resistance training. Doesn't take as much time. It's arguably safer um, in, in the sense that um, people, people ruin their, their joints, their knees and their hips and their feet from long hours of running um, and, and that doesn't happen in high intensity exercise if done properly. Um, so there are all kinds of, uh, there are all kinds of reasons why resistance training is overall just a better form of exercise. Hmm. And not, uh, not taking into account dog bites. <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. As you had written in your book. Uh, so, uh, you uh, stress this uh, phrase done if done properly and uh, what kind of regimen and uh, do you consider a proper form of resistance exercise um yeah good good point because my views on that have changed pretty pretty substantially since i wrote muscle up and um i i'm now practicing and advocating high intensity resistance training so what is the difference here? And, and, you know, what is, like you say, what is perform properly mean? Well, for one thing, um, in weight training as performed by the average man in, in, in the gym, for example, um, there is a fair amount of injury risk. Um, and that usually happens when people are lifting weights that are very heavy, that they cannot move in good form. Um, and then, uh, you know, muscles and joints get put in positions that they're not supposed to be in and then injury happens. Um, so the first part of um, properly 
is to always use good form um, to, to use movements in which your uh, muscles and joints are aligned like they are supposed to move. Um, the second part um, of, of properly is to use high intensity. So um, I believe that the way that someone should perform a set of uh, an exercise set when they're doing doing resistance training is to uh, move the weight to be under resistance, under load, um, and, and to do repetitions in good form until you reach momentary muscular failure, which means you're doing repetitions until you cannot do another repetition. Um, one way of looking at this is that lifting weights is not about moving a weight up and down to, to move a weight somehow. It's about something that you do to your body. It's about effectively loading your muscles so that you give them the anabolic stimulus that they need to get stronger and bigger. Um, so uh, too, many, too many people uh, feel that the purpose of going into a gym and lifting weights is to move a weight that that's their task, but their task is to really effectively load their muscles. It's a subtle distinction, but I think it could save a lot of people from getting hurt. Um, when done properly, you really don't need uh, a high amount of resistance uh, or weight. Um, and so that's, that's uh, one of the things. Another thing is that you should, people should move relatively quickly in between sets. So standard practice in weightlifting now is to do a set of an exercise uh, for a fixed number of repetitions, often say 10, or you know, they, you'll often hear eight to 12 repetitions, something like that. And then, um, then people will rest between sets. So sit down for a minute or two and rest and then go back and do another set of the same exercise. So what I advocate for one thing is only one set per exercise. Um, there's a lot of good research that shows that doing multiple sets um, at, at the very least uh, is subject to very diminishing returns in terms of your um, in terms of the results that you get, um, and at at worst, actually, there is research that shows that doing extra sets actually does nothing at all in terms of the results you get, and it can be counterproductive because you're actually you you are uh, put, placing stress on your body. Your body needs to rest and recover from your exercise, that's very important. And if you uh, are doing multiple sets of an exercise with no extra return on your strength gains, then it, this can be counterproductive because then you need to rest longer before you do uh, another workout. Um, you could be effectively straining your, your uh, musculature so much that um, they aren't growing optimally, getting stronger optimally. So um, in any case, and then moving quickly between sets. So I advocate that people do a set of exercise and then use minimal rest between exercise. So if somebody, for example, uh, if, if, you, if you're talking about an exercise that involves large compound movements that exercise a lot of the muscles on your body, let's say a squat or a deadlift. It's uh, entirely possible you're gonna have to stop for a minute and catch your breath after you do this set. So I don't advocate, you don't, you know, you don't have to run over to the next, the next set and, and it's something like that. But generally speaking, you wanna use minimal rest between sets. So part of what I mean when I say, uh, properly performed resistance training is such that 
it will increase your cardiovascular fitness. When you, when you do, uh, I, I've, I have uh, uh, experimented a little bit or, or tracked a little bit on myself just recently, uh, a couple of weeks ago, starting a couple of weeks ago. I normally, I'm not one for tracking much. I don't wear any fitness apps or anything like that. But um, when I was doing my workout, I stopped to uh, take my heart rate after a set. And I found that after a first, the first set of my workout, my heart rate got up to about 144. And after the second set and pretty much through the rest of the workout, every time I took my heart rate, it was about 156 and up. So at, at my age, allegedly, my, uh, my maximum heart rate is something around 165. Uh, according to various, there are various formulas for calculating this, but the, the apparently most accurate one puts me at about there. So I'm, I'm up just doing resistance training. I'm getting my heart rate up to close to my maximum, my apparent maximum. Um, so this is a way to improve cardiovascular fitness. Um, and, and that's a lot of what I mean by, um, proper resistance training. If you look at various studies done on resistance training, um, you know, you will find some of them that say, well, we, you know, didn't see the results in, in terms of, you know, better cardiovascular fitness or something compared to aerobic training. But those types of resistance training where they found those results are a more traditional model of resistance training, like I was talking about, where they do a set, rest in between a set, uh, and then do another set of the same exercise. So if properly done, uh, a workout should really take no more than about 30 minutes. Um, these days, I get my workouts done in under 25 minutes. Um, but it is a very intense 25 minutes. Um, and I am uh, you know, with my heart rate up and uh, breathing heavily the whole time, very minimal rest between sets. You know, I have to, I'm working out at home now. So there's, you know, I have to move weights. I have to, you know, uh, change the weights on my barbell and this sort of thing. So, you know, there are inevitable delays, but may, mainly it's, it's, it's all one, you know, it's all one workout. I'm working out the whole time. So I wanted to add one other thing here about this um, dichotomy, alleged dichotomy between aerobic training and resistance training is that um, we talk about aerobic training as uh, good for your heart. In other words, it improves your cardiovascular system, your heart and your arteries and so on and so forth. Um, but what when when your body is working when your heart is pumping it is pumping blood it is pumping oxygen and nutrients uh into the areas of the body that need it and carrying away waste products away from uh, the areas that need it and um what it is doing is supporting muscles your your muscles are doing the work and if if you're doing aerobic training uh, you're, you're running, for example, what your heart is doing is supporting your muscles that are, that are moving and, um, your, your, your body, your heart does not know what, it, you know, it does not know whether you're running or doing resistance training or anything like that. It's, it's supporting muscles. That's what it's doing. And so when you do resistance training, you're getting much the same effect as when you're doing aerobic training, the difference being that in resistance training, you are doing exercises that are effective for strengthening your muscle. Uh, in other words, you're, you're working specific muscles and applying them the most effective 
um, dose of exercise that will allow them to get stronger. True. And uh, one of our first interactions actually um, was when you tweeted about uh, about of your exercise. And I asked if everyone with any goal can use uh, one set to failure. And that was a very important tweet to me and changed my exercise regimen. Uh, before that, I had to go to the gym and I needed some motivation to do, for example, three sets of pull-ups, three sets of some exercise afterwards, some exercise afterwards, and every one of them multiplied by three. But afterwards, I was like, okay, I am going to do one set of that, that exercise. Better I give it all my energy. And there is less resistance in, I mean, psychological resistance, and I can go uh, do the exercise with minimal psychological re resistance. And I could pack more exercises in uh, one session of workout. And uh, then I decreased uh, the rest. It was two minutes. And then uh, you suggested, for example, minimal 30 seconds, for example. Um, when I first made that change, uh, the number of reps that I could do understandably decreased. But maybe next week or so, uh, it came back to normal. And I adapted to that um, shorter time of exercise, more intense exercise. And I believe that I can set more goals because I do calisthenics. And for example, for a long time, I had to work on my pistol squats and it wouldn't improve very much but now i i can see more improvement in that in those pistol squats and i can also move on to more exercises my left uh, leg still needs some improvement but uh, it's very good that i can pack different um, goals in one workout session and this is a kind of exercise that you are suggesting for improving um, metabolic health and also for uh, improving muscle mass. But how about someone has some other fitness or athletic goal in mind? For example, if someone is a martial artist, can they still use the same uh, kind of exercise regimen, or if it differs, how does it differ? Yes, uh, yes, they can. Um, I think it, what is important to distinguish when we're talking about resistance training is that um, is is the difference between athletics and sports on the one hand and strength training on the other. So for example, there are forms of lifting weights that are sports. So Olympic weightlifting, for example, powerlifting, those are sports. Um, and certainly for if someone wants to get better at doing Olympic weightlifting, which always involves lifting a weight over your head, then they're going to have to practice that. Um, and that is different from strength training. Um, likewise, with powerlifting, this is maybe a better example even because uh, powerlifting is similar to Olympic weightlifting, except that the lifts are different. Um, in powerlifting, they do deadlifts, uh, squats, and bench press, which are not in the Olympics. Um, so people confuse, so powerlifting is obviously about lifting the heaviest weight you can in one of these extra, one of these moves um, for one repetition, but that's not necessarily, and it, and it isn't the best way to improve your strength, right? So um, in any case for someone, let's say a martial artist or a runner, um, getting stronger can it, it getting stronger I, i'm going to go out on a limb here and say getting stronger will always improve their performance in any kind of athletic activity 
Um, but to do, you know, to be better at martial arts or whatever sport we're talking about, they have to practice the sport. So um, resistance training or strength training is a form of, um, in, you know, increasing, increasing the strength of your muscles, of your body, but it is uh, different from an athletic skill. Now, it might, uh, for somebody who is, let, let's say, hypothetically, a martial artist or a boxer in a certain weight category, then, um, and they want to stay in that weight category, then, uh, you know, putting on a lot of muscle I suppose, in a sense, could be detrimental if it puts them in a higher weight category or something like that. But in most cases, I don't think that's an issue. Um, bodybuilders, for example, who put on a lot of muscle, I mean, these days, most of them are using drugs. And so for someone who is drug free, that's that's not an issue as, as I see it. Um, it is quite difficult to put on muscle. And, um, you know, one of, the, one of the things you sometimes hear about from people who, who don't know much about strength training or who are not doing strength training is, well, you know, I'm worried that I'm going to get too big or something like that. That takes effort. That's right. Don't worry. Uh, you say, don't worry, bro. You, you won't get too big. It's impossible. It's, it's, um and and especially you hear that from women oh i don't want to get all muscular and so on and you know it's it's just really difficult you you won't get too muscular uh if you are drug free and um you are uh, have a nor normal build to begin with i mean so i was talking about power lifters a minute ago um power lifters are people, you know, generally speaking, who, you, who were born with the type of build that is good for powerlifting. And the same can be said about almost any sport. Um, you don't, you don't see, um, you, you don't see guys who are built like American football players going into the Tour de France, right? Um, and vice versa. So there is a sense in which, I mean, if somebody's, if somebody becomes good at a sport at an early age, it's usually because they have not only some talent, but their body uh, size and shape is good for that sport. Swimming, for example, swimming, swimmers have a particular build, cyclists have a particular build, marathon runners have a particular build, um, and, and and bodybuilders as well. I mean, um, despite the fact that many of them, you know, uh, at the top levels are using drugs, still they're big guys to begin with, right? So they, they can put on muscle a lot easier. Um, Arnold Schwarzenegger, if, if you've seen uh, photos of him when he was 16 years old, he, he looked, he was bigger and had more muscle than most men will will get after you know a lifetime of lifting weights. Certainly, I'm I'm uh, like using myself as an example. I'm pretty avid at what I do at strength training and so on. But you know, somebody like Arnold, who was naturally his size, naturally had good. Um, a good physiology for growing muscle, you know, at a very early age, he started lifting weights and just got great results. By the time, by the time he was 18, 19 years old, he was already winning bodybuilding contests and he looked fantastic. So it's part of what it means to be, um, you know, the sport of bodybuilding, if you want to call it that, he was definitely naturally cut out for it just like other people are naturally cut out for playing American football or for being a racing cyclist or something like that. Right. Um, how about 
uh, supplements. Let's get to that. Uh, what kinds of? I know that you don't uh, you don't have a positive view about um, testosterone as uh, to be used as a, a supplement for everyone. And what kinds of supplements do you think can help? And at what dosage? At what time? I know that you have ex uh, explained that in the book, but since you mentioned that you have changed some of your views uh, after writing of that book, I want to know what you think about that now. Um, right. So, uh, well, you mentioned testosterone, and I'm I'm not against uh, someone using testosterone for, for example, if if a, a middle-aged man has low testosterone and uh, testosterone therapy can help, I'm not against that. However, I think that um, it's pretty obvious that in most cases, the reason why men have low testosterone is due to their lifestyle. Lack of exercise, terrible food, um, fail, failure to do resistance training, becoming overweight or obese, all those things. Those things should be fixed first, in my view, before someone tries testosterone therapy. That said, uh, proper testosterone therapy appears to have few downsides that I can see. It, it's, a, it's a lot, it's safe. And a lot of the concerns people used to have about it, um, I feel are unfounded. As far as strength training goes though, specifically, well, there's, there's one supplement, creatine, that uh, appears to be very useful. So creatine is also quite safe. Um, we, the human body, we, we make our own creatine and we also ingest it in our diet. Um, so uh, mainly in the form, mainly in meat, when we eat meat, we get creatine. So uh, creatine can help uh, with strength. Uh, it, it is the purpose of creatine as a molecule is to provide more energy at the highest intensities. So if someone has enough creatine in their muscles, they uh, would be able to perform at a higher intensity than someone who has less creatine. Now that said, um, I think that creatine has, may, may have only marginal benefits for someone who is eating a proper diet. So for example, if you look at some, some studies where they've give, given creatine to vegetarians, they find pretty good benefits to, to creatine. Um, and, but it is less so if someone is not a vegetarian. So um, yeah, that's, so that's what I think about creatine. It's, it's safe enough. And so if someone wants to use it, there's no problem with it. Um, another uh, supplement, not really a supplement because it's a food is whey protein. So whey protein uh, can be very useful. It's high in leucine, which is amino acid, which most stimulates uh, muscle anabolism. And if, if whey protein is taken immediately after training, when muscles are in full growth mode, that can provide a, a boost beyond what uh, one would get just from eating high protein food. Um, so, you know, those, those are two that are specifically for muscle growth. Now, muscle growth, muscle strength, good muscle, uh, health, you know, also depends on a lot of things. So, so anything that is going to make you healthier is going to uh, help your, you know, your results from training. For example, vitamin D. Um, if someone is deficient in vitamin D, they will probably have difficulty putting on a lot of muscle. Um, if somebody is sufficient in vitamin D, then taking more vitamin D is not going to help them. Um, same, same thing with things like magnesium or zinc, 
Um, these are very important in, in our diet. Um, and if somebody is deficient in magnesium or deficient in zinc, taking them can help. But for someone who is on a healthy diet and has been eating a healthy diet for some time, then taking more of those is uh, unlikely to help. So we are getting closer to our and to, to your triple S triple S slogan. So can you uh, introduce those S's and also expand on that? Sure. So um, I, I've used the shorthand sun, steak, and steel for uh, basically sort of the essence of what I'm talking about. Um, so yeah, it is a shorthand. It uh, certainly doesn't encompass every single thing in health, but uh, maybe 90% of it, I don't know. Um, but in any case, so what, is, what does that mean? So sun, uh, from sun, we get vitamin D. Um, we get other benefits from being in the sun that we don't get just from, say, taking a vitamin D supplement. Um, and, and, for example, uh, generation of nitric oxide, which helps uh, arterial health. Um, plus, by being outside, you get fresh air, which is important, more important than, uh, than I think any of us realized and, until about a year ago. Um, it, it was interesting to me because I found out a lot about this too, learned a lot about this in the, in the sense of, uh, you know, the COVID pandemic, um, that long ago, well, not that long ago, but let's say 50 to a hundred years ago and, and beyond that, that, um, people that, that doctors, believed in the importance of fresh air and ventilation. And you, in, in the flu pandemic of 1918 and 19, oh. it, it, you often saw where they, the patients would be taken outside in their beds and they would be out in the sun and breathing fresh air. Um, hospital ventilation was thought to be very important and the hospitals were designed so that they would get good ventilation um, and, and with high ceilings, for example, and windows that would open. Um, but now with everything all mechanically done that way with air conditioning and heating and everything um, and low ceilings, it's all sealed up. And so ventilation isn't as good. But in any case, getting out in the fresh air is important. And you get, obviously you get that if you're out in the sun. Steak. So um, we've all heard a lot of things about nutrition in the past few decades that I believe are terribly wrong. Uh, it all started with um, uh, experts telling us to avoid saturated fat because they thought saturated fat caused heart disease. And uh, meat is one of the big sources of saturated fat. So people ate less meat. And um, there is definitely a link to the obesity epidemic there because as people ate less meat, um, well, the obesity epidemic began right around the time that they started saying this and it's got only gotten worse since. Um, if someone were to challenge me about causality there, about eating less meat, uh, having something to do with the obesity epidemic, I would say that it's long been known that eating meat is, uh, eating meat almost exclusively is one of the best weight loss diets. Um, so because people get protein, they don't get the carbohydrates or sugar or anything else. Um, so it's a very healthy food. Uh, generally, pe most people should eat more meat. And this is a message that is totally uh, contradictory to, to what we hear in, in mainstream news and from uh, on high from the experts and so on. So steak, uh, definitely. Um, in, my, in my view, ultra processed food is what's really responsible for uh, our epidemic of ill health and obesity. And so um, the people should be eating real whole foods and meat is a real whole food, one of the best. 
steel, well, steel refers to weightlifting or resistance training. So, um, we, you know, we've already talked about that, why I think resistance training is a superior form of exercise. Um, taken, taken together, so I talked about sun, steak, and seal individually, but, but I think taken together, they represent something more than just all individually. There's a, there's a synergism there and that being strong, being healthy, um, leads to much more self-confidence. It leads to being happy. It leads to a sense of well-being that I think people who don't do these things really can't understand until they, till they try it. Um, so this is why I believe that some version of sun, steak, and steel should be practiced by just about everybody. Hmm. Right. And if uh, someone uh, adheres to this uh, triple S standard, is there any, uh, can they still benefit from extra protein? For example, after exercise, is it better to get a steak or is it better to get uh, 25 grams to 50 grams of pro whey protein? Well, that's a good question. It gets into, you know, uh, this, some of the science. Uh, for example, um, I guess getting to the nub of that matter is the question of, is there an anabolic window? So the anabolic window refers to the idea that you should get protein um, within a short time after you do strength training. And there, there are various arguments back and forth, various studies looking at this. Um, from what I can see is that if someone is getting enough at, you know, adequate protein in their diet overall, the anabolic window at the very least shrinks in importance. Um, the way I look at it is there's certainly no harm in getting some whey protein after my workout, which is why I always want to get it. It's, I don't want to leave any gains on the table. I, I don't want to take the chance that I'm not getting enough. So there, and there have been a number you know, dozens, scores, maybe even hundreds of studies looking at how much protein is necessary or best for uh, gaining muscle, assuming someone is already doing resistance training. And um, the figure of 1.8 grams per kilogram of body weight is usually uh, considered to be ad adequate, certainly adequate. There are studies that look at higher protein intakes than that, and there are, there are indications that you can get even better results. But again, like with most anything, there are diminishing returns. Um, so if you increase your protein intake, let's say from 1.8 to 2.5 grams per kilogram of body weight, would you get better results? or how, how much greater results would you get? Well, depends. There are probably a lot of other things more important than that, like how you train and so on. Um, so then the next thing is, you know, how much protein do people typically get? And people typically get a lot less protein than that. So um, yeah, so adding some protein. So certainly if someone was eating a healthy diet that had plenty of meat, fish, eggs, some dairy products, they would likely be getting protein up in that range, but most people don't do that. Right, and as far as gains are concerned, what else can we do to increase the gains? And my question actually is specifically about uh, the temperature of the water that we are going to use afterwards uh for example in one of your tweets i noticed that uh, you mentioned that doing cold showers i guess i i am guessing about the number uh, decreases their gains by 70 percent or something so okay so what what we're really talking about uh 
Well, I don't think that the number is nearly that high as, as far as mm-hmm. decreasing gains. But what we're talking about is cold water immersion. So there are ath- athletes and athletic facilities doing cold water immersion. So when people do uh, hard training um, in whatever sport they're doing, uh, they would get into a cold, basically a cold bath or a cold pool. Uh, and with the water at 50 degrees Fahrenheit or less, uh, let's see, I'm not sure what that is in Celsius. <laughs> it's, it's one of those uh, I tried to convert American it. things. But it's, if, if you were sitting in 50 degree Fahrenheit uh, water, it would feel pretty cold. Mm. Um, it's 10 degrees centigrade. Okay, that's, that sounds about right. Um, so the idea being that it helps recovery from a hard workout and so on. And and it lowers inflammation by being in the cold water, immersed in cold water for 10 minutes or more. And, but what they found is that it can impede gains really. Um, In other words, when you exercise, you are putting a stress on your body. You're putting a, you know, if you do resistance training, you're putting a stress on your muscles and your body. If you're, if you're, uh, if, 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 if you're practicing soccer or, you know, something like that, you're putting a stress on your body and your body reacts to the stress by improving. It upregulates all these mechanisms to get you stronger, to get your cardiovascular fitness better and so on. And so by dampening the effect using cold water immersion, you are, you are dampening the effect of exercise. So uh, it's, I couldn't speak to whether it's advisable for someone who is a serious athlete to do that or not. I mean, serious athletes are training daily. It might be beneficial for them. I don't know. I'm, I, you know, I, I don't train athletes for sports, so I don't know. However, for someone who wants to, someone like say, just like myself, who wants to get stronger and do resistance training, then cold water immersion is probably not advisable. Now, the reason why I stress cold water immersion is because a cold shower is not the same thing. Um, if, if someone went into a cold shower after uh, training, um, for one thing, it's usually only a couple of minutes maybe, And for another, it's not full immersion. And for another, the water might not be as cold as the 10 degree Celsius water that those athletes are using. So um, I guess that covers my view on on cold water and exercise. Yeah, I'm asking that because I have benefited from cold showers very much and I uh, incorporate them in my daily life. And after reading that tweet and seeing that link, I I don't remember the number. And as you said, it's way lower than that, probably. Uh, I decided to do it every morning. And if I am taking a shower after exercise, I strictly only do uh, warm showers. And somehow we... Make a turn and go back to the uh, to sun and vitamin D. I uh, live in a place which has very little sun and two months of sun uh, in the summer, and it's a very low intensity sun. Uh, I mean, in Poland, also in Canada, in uh, North Europe, uh, people. I cannot get that much sun. What is the solution for them? Well, certainly uh, taking vitamin D as a supplement can go a long way toward, towards helping with that. And I mean, I, I live in California and even here, you know, in the, there are several months in the winter where there's not adequate sun to get vitamin D. Um, so I take vitamin D in the winter. Um, so that would, that would be one way. Um, and there are certain, certain foods, uh, mainly, mainly fish and other seafoods that are relatively high in vitamin D. 
Um, so that would be that would be one way of doing it. Another another thing to consider is that vitamin D is a fat soluble vitamin, and so it stays in the body a relatively long time. Um, and so if someone got adequate vitamin D during the summer, then their vitamin D levels just only gradually decline over the winter um, and wouldn't decline at all, of course, if they were taking vitamin D or maybe eating a lot of fish or something like that. Um, so um, those are, you know, that that's about it as far as, I mean, if you consider that, let's say even in Northern Europe, um, not that long ago, let's just pull out a number, a hundred years ago, most people were working outside and they were working as farmers or laborers or something like that. So however inadequate the sun is, they were getting some, but now most of us are working indoors and so we we don't get any we we don't get enough sun. And uh, how, how about when the sun comes through the glass? Does it still have the same beneficial effects, or is it going to diminish? No, it it doesn't. Um, it it there are a couple of things you have to look at in terms of when we're talking about the sun and health. So, getting getting light in your eyes from from the sun. I mean, I'm not talking about directly looking at the sun, but opening opening your windows and getting light in is definitely beneficial because it helps set circadian rhythms. Walking outside in the sun, even if even if the sun is low in the sky, like say in the early morning, you're not getting any vitamin D, but it is beneficial. Um, however, sun coming in through the windows, um, it blocks, uh, UVB radiation, so you would not get much, if any, vitamin D production in your skin from sun coming into your windows. Oh, that's because I still, when it is too cold, I try to get the sun from the window, but it doesn't work that, uh, that much. And I have heard something about uh, the lights that are used for rept reptiles. That can also work. Is that true? What's your take on that? Uh, yeah, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure specifically about lights used for reptiles, but there are sun lamps that definitely work. Yes, and, and some people use them for sure. Hmm. Okay, right. Uh, and I want to be respectful of your time. How much, how much more time have you got? Well, I, I, I can stick around another five, 10 minutes or huh. so. Is, is, Oh, okay, that's good because I have one or two at least important questions. Uh, okay, one, sure. One of the things that has been always a big question uh, for me is that you advocate uh, using al alcohol as a part of your diet. And that's surprising to me because I know that you are rogue <laughs> and I am uh, uh, kind of, but uh, I don't think that my view is that, well, if you use alcohol it's not a health food but the way you view it is as if it is a health food and you also uh, openly say that you get some of your calories from from uh, wine and i think it was your last night's tweet apollo in the morning and dionysus <laughs> <laughs> yes. by the night uh, I have some guesses that maybe uh, you consider um, wine as a fermented food and you see some benefits in that. But I want to see why do you consider wine? Oh, okay, all right, good, good question. Um, so for one thing, um, most, so there are, there are many studies that show that people who, drink moderate amounts of alcohol. So for a man, one to two drinks a day would be considered moderate, um, have better health than people who don't drink at all. And uh, so the question is, uh, for starters, is alcohol causing the better health 
or is this just an artifact of the fact that who these people are that something else has to do with their better health and they just happen to drink a couple of drinks a day so there there's evidence on for both of both of those ideas um, for one thing people who are of higher socioeconomic status in other words they're more educated they make more money they also tend to drink more than people who who are lower in socioeconomic status those are people who tend not to drink at all so and and those people who are who are more educated or make more money are also healthier than those other people so does alcohol have anything to do with their their better health or with why they are so that's an open question there there have been some um when this connection was first seen several decades ago, the, the, the objection was immediately raised that they're comparing them to a group of people who might include ex-drinkers, for example, if they were alcoholics who stopped drinking or who were, had ill health, so they didn't feel like they could drink, they're in the, they're in the group of non-drinkers, so they would ex be expected to have worse health overall. But there have been other studies that have excluded these people and looked at only lifelong non-drinkers. And they found the, the association was attenuated, but the association was still there. So then the idea of causality, well, there have been animal studies, for example, um, there, there were rats that were placed on lifelong what they considered moderate alcohol, and they lived longer than rats who didn't get the alcohol. Um, there have been studies on humans that have, you know, for example, they have them, let's have you drink um, two glasses of wine every night for two weeks or however long they did it, four weeks. And then they look at things like insulin resistance, HDL cholesterol, and so on. And they were all improved in the people who, who drank the wine. So, um, I, I have been, I have tried to be very careful in, um, and, and, and by the way, you, uh, that's good that, you know, you understood the Apollo in the morning Dionysus at night. I think that's a, that's maybe, maybe a lot of people didn't get that. It's a, uh, but anyway, um, I've, I've tried to be very careful in, in when I talk about this topic, not to advocate it for people who don't drink. Um, alcohol is a potentially addictive drug and it can lead to problems for many people. And there are certainly plenty of people out there who should not drink. Um, my, but uh, at least for example, uh, it, you know, in the United States, there are certainly plenty of people who drink. Um, I, I am of Irish and Scottish ancestry and it's considered completely normal to to drink alcohol in in you know among my family and and so on among people of my ancestry so it's basically i'm just trying to show that um a, a lot of the information it's so-called information out there about alcohol is wrong you see you see a lot of um um you know, again, the experts from on high, I mean, over the last few years, they're just starting to say things like you should never drink and it's terrible for you and all this kind of thing. I, I think that's just completely wrong. Right. So it is because the association between complications from alcohol use and uh, that association is weak. And that's why you, you do not consider it the health food, but you... Uh, see it as benign well uh yes I, I i guess you could say that there are there are arguments that that say that moderate alcohol is a health food um i don't you know since this is so um it's not scientifically settled and sealed so i don't know if i would want to go that far but it is certainly moderate drinking is certainly yeah it's benign 
And once it was just on a news uh, show that I heard about it, that super centurions, um, all of them drink alcohol and also smoke. And that really seems counterintuitive. And the scientist on the show was saying that maybe they have alcohol and that helps them socialize better. And because of that, they benefit from the social as aspects of alcohol use. And that leads into them having a longer life. Uh, yes. And what's your, t let's get out of um, health in some way and let's get to uh, Bitcoin. What's your take on the last surge of Bitcoin? <laughs> Bitcoin. Well, it's definitely something I changed changed my mind about over the last year. Um, I I've, I learned about it, I guess, for the first time several years ago. I'm not sure when, but I didn't really think too much of it. And um, but then I basically on Twitter, I saw a lot of very smart people that who who I respected talking about it. So uh, I, I looked into it further and I became uh, convinced that it's the wave of the future. Yeah, it seems so. And I hope so. And uh, so uh, thank you so much. And uh, where can people follow you and uh, re read about you and follow your stuff? Uh, uh, yeah, thanks. So uh, I'm on Twitter. My handle is mangan150. And uh, my website is roguehealthandfitness.com. Thank you very much. You've been so generous with your time. And thanks for accepting to be a part of this program. My, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Hope you've enjoyed this episode of Round the Fire. If you are watching this video on YouTube, please give it a like and hit the subscribe button. If you're listening to the podcast, please leave the five-star review. It would cost you nothing but help me a great deal, especially if you do so on Apple Podcasts. Also, if you feel particularly generous, consider supporting me.